Pardon. Today, the Select Committee will hold a hearing to focus on an issue that underlies all of our discussions on technology, but which is often overlooked. Intellectual property rights and the role they play in developing uh, clean uh, technology solutions. The gentleman from Wisconsin, uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner, is a leading congressional authority on intellectual property rights, and during our recent trip to China, he constantly reminded our Chinese host that technology must solve the problems of energy security and climate change. But to do so effectively, we need a rigorous system to protect intellectual property. I share that view, and we're having this hearing to explore those issues. There is a huge and growing demand for climate-related technologies. It can and should be met by interventions, uh, uh, inventions of American companies. America is well equipped to lead and provide the cutting edge technologies we so urgently need for solving the climate and energy challenges. But we need to develop the solutions for tomorrow and then deploy them worldwide. Passage of the American Clean Energy and Security Act will push entrepreneurs and college kids, Silicon Valley stars and Stanford roommates, to work hard and to try their luck at inventing new ways uh, to produce renewable energy and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. When those entrepreneurs succeed, uh, what will happen to their product and know-how? That is the question we will explore today. In the upcoming Copenhagen negotiations, technology cooperation will be an important topic as countries look for ways to enhance deployment of climate technology around the world. At the international level, there is a consensus that clean technologies have to be developed and deployed, and that the current efforts in this respect have to be enhanced. There is also general agreement that the private and public sector will have to find new and better ways to bring those solutions to the villages of India uh, and the towns in South Africa. But, through, but though countries might agree on the general direction, there are very different views on the ways to achieve the goals. With only 130 days left until the Copenhagen negotiations, the world faces great challenges to find the agreement on how to address the technology challenge. Today is a good time to take a close look at business opportunities, at technology cooperation, at barriers to spreading solutions, and at the closely related question of the protection of intellectual property rights. Intellectual property rights enable innovators to be rewarded for their creativity and investment of time and money. But these rights must be balanced uh, with the needs for incentives uh, and the common good and uh, in the interest of sharing ideas and technology. This is why in the U.S. we have time limits on patents and copyrights. This is why the United States and all members of the World Trade Organization agree uh, on a treaty which outlines how intellectual property rights should be protected on a global basis. We have the, interna the international framework in place, uh, though I appreciate that there are disagreements as to how well that framework operates in daily practice. Nonetheless, I think it is important to see if we can develop policies within this framework that can trigger the innovation and deployment that we want. With American ingenuity, we can become the world leaders and we have become the world leaders in communications and information technology. Let us again embrace our opportunities for our country and businesses so that they can lead the world to a low carbon future. And because this is our last hearing uh, before the recess, I would also like to take a minute to recognize the retirement uh, of a uh, t Tom. Where's Tom here? In Colorado. Tom is not here. <laughs> oh God. Uh, <laughs> Tom, who's uh, Tom? Who is already uh, in retirement? <laughs> uh, uh, I would. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I have worked with Tom starting back in the early 1980s uh, when I chaired my first subcommittee, the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee in the old Interior Committee. And Tom worked on the staff of Manny Lujan. Uh, Tom gave many distinguished years of service uh, to that committee and then uh, at the Interior Department. Uh, and I was pleased to work and travel with him over the past three years as part of the select committee staff. He was a consummate professional 
who was always fair and committed to the work uh, of this institution. I know he uh, uh, cannot uh, be here today, uh, but I did want to take this opportunity to, uh, congratulating, to congratulate him for his long, successful career in public service. Uh, that completes the opening statement of the chair. Let me turn and uh, recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me say that I deeply appreciate the comments that you've made on the retirement of the Republican Staff Director of the Select Committee, Tom Weimer. Uh, when I recruited Tom for this job, uh, his extensive background, both on the Hill and in the Interior Department on energy issues, was invaluable in helping get the committee off the ground. And despite the fact that uh, the chairman and I have uh, some rather deep disagreements over how to go about solving the problems of climate change and energy security, uh, Tom has worked very professionally with the Democratic staff in order to make the work of the uh, select committee a success. Uh, after hearing your good words about Tom, uh, I'm going to make an offer to you. You know, over here on the Republican side, anybody that uses the word cap and trade instead of cap and tax uh, ends up having to buy a round of refreshments for uh, everybody else. And uh, uh, Mr. Weimer does owe a couple of rounds for letting uh, the wrong language slip out. And when we have uh, payback time, Mr. Chairman, I will be sure to invite you so that you can enjoy uh, the results of Mr. Weimer's slipping up on what uh, uh, the Waxman-Markey bill really is. So stay tuned. Now as far as my opening statement goes. Can I say that we have the same thing on our side? Uh, anyone who uses the phrase cap and trade is similarly punished. Um, if they don't use it, instead they must use the words energy independence and clean energy jobs revolution, okay? And so we have a similar fund on our side mm -hmm. uh, that we might be able to work with you to uh, okay. have a really good party. Well, I, I thank the chair Not for- Democrat or Republican. I, I thank yeah. the chair for those very good words. <laughs> uh, and remember, some words count and some words don't, and I'm glad you agree that cap and trade is a bad word. Having said all of that, uh, my opening statement, global warming has become less about science than opportunism. Soon after scientists rang alarm bells on carbon emissions, everyone from financial institutions to developing nations realized that they could get rich off of it. So while scientists continued to debate the best course of action, those with vested interests declare that the science is settled and offer solutions that conveniently would also make them rich. But we can't allow the need for action to make us victims of self-serving proposals against American interests. Efforts to weaken intellectual property rights at the ongoing UN climate change negotiations are a perfect example. Developing countries like China and India see climate change as an opportunity to gain free access to American IPR. But far from mitigating climate change, relaxation of IPR would ruin ours and the world's only hope of responding in a long-term way. China, along with other developing nations in the so-called Group of 77, wants the UN to establish a, quote, executive body of technology that would be governed by many of these same countries. The Chinese and others propose that this body would determine, quote, technology-related financial requirements, unquote and seek to ensure that privately owned technologies are available despite the intellectual property protections. Put simply, China and the developing nations seek to transfer the developed world's clean energy technologies to an unelected UN body which they would control. The current draft UN negotiating text that will be considered in Bonn early next month includes proposals that would, quote, exclude from patenting in developing countries environmentally sound technologies to adapt to or mitigate climate change, unquote. Require, quote, compulsory licensing for environmentally safe and sound technologies, unquote. And to ensure, quote, access to intellectual property protected technologies and associated know-how to developing countries on non-exclusive, royalty-free terms, unquote. 
These governments argue that the risk of climate change justify free access to technologies to help mitigate it. The result would be a transfer of billions of dollars worth of the latest technologies. But the argument mistakes or willfully ignores the truth that technology is not a natural resource that can be pulled from the ground. New technologies will exist only if there are incentives to create them, and innovators should know that if they invest their time and money, their innovations will be protected, not given away. Chair Mar Chairman Markey and I respectfully disagree on how best to respond to climate change, but I think we agree that advanced technologies will ultimately be the long-term solution. Whether we adopt new taxes or a more economic approach, which I advocate, companies won't invest in new technologies unless we have strong IPR to protect them, and that IPR is enforced. As Steve Flutter, Flutter uh, the head of the Electro-Imagination -imagin Division of General Electric, uh, told the New York Times, why would anybody invest in anything that they would just have to give away? China and India in particular have a checkered history of protecting IPR. The U.S. Trade Representative reported to Congress in April that neither China nor India provide an adequate level of IPR protection or enforcement or market access for persons relying on intellectual property protections and placed both on its priority watch list of the worst offenders. The Trade Representative's report said overall piracy and counterfeiting levels in China remained unacceptably high in 2008, and that its IPR enforcement regime remains largely ineffective and non-deterrent, while piracy and counterfeiting, including pharmaceuticals, remain a serious problem in India, and its IPR enforcement regime remains weak. Rather than demanding free access to new technologies, if developing countries want to mitigate China climate change, they should pledge to protect them so that the investments will be made to develop those new technologies. As the world works toward a new international agreement on climate change, I urge the Obama administration to end hopes that IPR will be freely granted by proposing new language for a climate change treaty that strengthens intellectual property and promises to protect and encourage technological innovation. And I thank the Chair. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, thank you. I want to uh, welcome my uh, constituent neighbor, uh, Robert Nelson, is here today with Arch Venture Partners. He is, embodies, I think, the spirit of innovation, and I look forward to his testimony. Uh, I also have a little um, token of our appreciation, Mr. Chair, for your leadership. This is a little bit of sapphire energy, algae-based biofuels, and this will get you uh, the last uh, half mile to drive to the White House for the signing ceremony uh, for the ACES bill. So we just want to make sure you can get there to the South Lawn. So we have a little work between now and then, but that'll get you there. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> I want to make one serious comment. Um, this is serious. There's nothing more serious than algae. Uh, this issue of intellectual property, to me, if, if we're going to be assisting the developing world, and it is a serious issue, uh, but it ought not to be at the expense um, of innovators, and it ought not to be in a way that, that depresses and suppresses innovation. And if we are going to be providing assistance to make uh, new technologies available to the developing world, it ought to be based in a way that the community as a whole finances it rather than just the innovation community. To do otherwise really suppresses and prevents the innovation from coming into existence that we might be able to share and or sell to the developing world. So I just want to make the point, and I, I know we'll talk about this today, that the worst way to share is to do something that would prevent that which you seek to share from ever coming into being. And when, in fact, you deprive folks of intellectual property, in fact, that that is what has happened. So there are better ways to do that, and I look forward to this discussion. Thank you. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And I am delighted that we're having this hearing uh, today. I do think that it is an imperative that the federal government protect the intellectual property rights of our innovators. One of the things that uh, 
I realized as we were working on preparation for this hearing is that over the past seven years, all of the clean energy technology patents that have been uh, put in place, 50 percent of those are U.S. innovators. So we are deeply invested in making certain that we protect that 50 percent of all the patents are held by U.S. citizens. I, it is of concern to me that there are new developments in international law and international agreements that may threaten these rights and could lead to some outright uh, piracy and theft of some of these patent protected technologies. I'm concerned too about uh, the climate fund accounts as a price for participation uh, in any treaty or agreement with uh, carbon emissions and um, I, I'm concerned about compulsory licensing and preferential pricing of low carbon uh, technologies um, that are coming into the marketplace. So those are all things that I'm going to want um, to take a look at as we have this hearing because I think we have to be careful that we don't barter or give away any of the work that's been done by our um, by our innovative community here, creative community. And I thank you for the hearing and look forward to what you all have to say. Great. I thank the gentlelady. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my uh, son um, is uh, an, an actor uh, in uh, California, of course, at this point. Um, uh, I'm paying for his acting, and uh, only I've, I think I'm the only one who's rented his, uh, the, the movie that's at Blockbuster, but um, I never thought about intellectual property rights uh, until he brought it to my attention. Nobody's going to steal the movie or lines <laughs> from it that he's, he's in, but uh, I am at least uh, conscious and aware of it, and I've been thrown into a controversy here, I think Mr. Sunsenbrenner is, is uh, on the judiciary uh, with uh, the royalties uh, related to many of the iconic performers uh, of the uh, 60s and 70s who, who are not uh, getting money uh, when their music is, is being played on, on radio. Uh, so all of a sudden, I've given a lot of, of thought to this whole issue uh, of uh, intellectual properties and the value of the new and in some cases yet to be uh, invented energy technologies uh, to both developed and developing uh, nations um, is immense. Uh, and most of the, uh, the, the uh, technologies that we're going to depend on have yet to be uh, invented. And so I look forward to this hearing. Uh, there are some uh, issues raised by uh, Midwest Research Institute in, in, uh, in the 5th Congressional District, which you may or may not be familiar with, which I would like to uh, lift up as we uh, continue this hearing today. So thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and the ranking member for this hearing. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we will now turn to our, uh, our panel. And our first witness today is Mr. Govi Rao, who is the chairman of Lighting Science Group Corporation a leading digital lighting solutions company. He is also a partner of uh, Pegasus uh, Capital Advisors, a private equity uh, fund manager uh, that is also uh, pursuing opportunities for sustainable business uh, solutions. Uh, he came back from his uh, business trip uh, in, uh, uh, to Bahrain yesterday night uh, in order to testify in front of us today. Uh, we thank you uh, so much, sir, for being here. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, um, Ranking Member Sessenbrenner and members of the committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. This is my first uh, such event. Um, as uh, Mr. Chairman, as you mentioned, I am Chairman of Lighting Science Group Corporation. Um, we design and develop uh, cutting-edge lighting products. And when I see products uh, here, lighting products here in the room, although they are energy saving, uh, what tickles me is that uh, we still use mercury to do that. And there is a way of doing that without mercury. And, and uh, actually that's what we do is manufacture LED light bulbs, which are innovative. Um, we have manufacturing operations in New Jersey, Florida, and California. We'd love to have operations in the rest of the country as well. 
And this hearing, to me, actually has a couple of uh, connotations. At the end of the day, if it's IP or innovation, uh, without the opportunity to commercialize any of this, it really doesn't matter. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about the commercialization aspect of it. And yes, I did come back from Bahrain last night, so I'm not quite sure what my clock says in my body clock here, but I'll try to survive the next few hours here. Um, I'm also a partner at Pegasus um, uh, Sustainable Century Merchant Bank that we launched this year. Um, the interesting story of Lighting Science is uh, we brought together, we as in Pegasus Capital, brought together four small innovative companies in the U.S., actually three small innovative companies in the U.S. and one in Europe. Small, not large enough to, um, to have global access, but very innovative and very entrepreneurial, one in California, one in Florida, and one in New Jersey. The, we have given them the ability to actually be able to, to provide their technology to the rest of the world by building scale in both manufacturing and R&D. Um, the three questions that were posed to me um, for today's testimony had to do with climate-related technologies in developing countries and what opportunities do I see. Um, and I have some exciting uh, opportunities that we just uncovered for us in the last few days in Bahrain. Um, and then IPR, as a, is it a barrier or a boost? And I have uh, my personal opinion about that. Um, and also to see if, in the context of the upcoming negotiations, in what my hopes and worries are. So I'm going to address the three of them today. Um, my experience in the last few years in lighting science, and two years especially, in building this company has been extremely powerful on two ways. One is seeking opportunities. Um, we look at this from a protectionist approach when it comes to intellectual property. However, uh, we also forget that uh, countries mentioned, um, the ranking member, um, Susan Brenner mentioned, China and India specifically. But if you take a look at Brazil, Russia, China, India, the Middle East, um, their gap, they're recognizing that their gap between their energy requirements today and energy uh, production today uh, is significant and it's growing. So they are actually being very aggressive on, in coming up with new ways of, of meeting that demand, both on the, on the energy generation side, but more importantly, they've also started very aggressively putting a cap on how to use the energy on the demand side. That, I think, is a powerful thing. And I will spend some time on that today because um, while we have new technologies that are coming on stream um, for generation, I believe there are a tremendous amount of technologies here in this country already existing to mitigate the demand. We're not doing much about them, and I'd like to kind of spend some time on that. This is a big paradigm for us, bigger than anything that we have seen before. So whether it's our uh, road to electricity uh, or, or landing on the moon, are we talking about the internet? Any of these things, all of these things pale in comparison to, I think, what we have in terms of climate change. We look at this from a geographic perspective in intellectual property, but I believe we have to, to change our paradigm and to look at this as a global activity. Um, let me give you an example of uh, my three days in Bahrain in, in the Middle East uh, over the last few days. The opportunities there on the demand uh, side of energy are absolutely fantastic. They are requesting us to help them curtail how they use energy, whether it's through controls or whether it's through LED lighting or whether it is digital motor control. There is demand and they know that they will have to get there one way or the other. Is there a buzz for my time? Okay. This is my first time, so I don't know how much time I have more. So. Um, they, they should have told you you have five minutes, okay, they did, uh, which is about to expire in 17 seconds. But since you didn't know the rules, we're going to give you a little bit more time. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Let me, let me cut to the chase here and, and get to the... Uh, I made a proposal here in the executive summary, which actually made it very, 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 very simple. Um, there is an urgent need to, to act for, uh, for us to act now as a global community. And we have to start breaking down the barriers, uh, the geographic barriers that we have built. The opportunities in the Middle East and Asia, in China, especially in India, are humongous and phenomenal. The technologies we have already, if we do not get there and actually make these technologies have the day-to-day have the -day on uncommercialization, then we will fall behind in leadership in the, in the, in the commercial world, leave alone the technology space. Uh, the markets are created locally. We just heard China is, is urging um, buy China, buy local. So make local, buy local. Uh, we have to be there with our technology. So I'm not saying give away the technology. I think there is a way of doing that. 
there is a way of establishing leadership. I have made a proposal. We'd love to answer more questions about that in terms of creating an exchange for IP where innovators get rewarded and not, not just taken for, taken, taken for granted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Oh, fine. Thank you. Uh, we, we appreciate that, Mr. Rao. And we're factoring in your jet lag as well. Yeah, I appreciate uh, that. Thank you. But uh, you'll, we'll have plenty of time to ask you questions. Our next witness uh, today is Mr. Robert Nelson, co-founder and managing director for Arch Venture Partners. His company has significant experience in the early sourcing, financing, and development of emerging technology companies. Uh, as a part of Arch Venture uh, Partners, Mr. Nelson has contributed to the development of over 130 companies, including uh, leaders in the fields of solar and biofuels. These companies hold over 1,200 U.S. patents and patent applications. We uh, thank you for joining us today, Mr. Nelson. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chairman Markey and uh, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner. My name is Robert Nelson, and I'm the co-founder Ma and managing director of Arch Venture Partners. Arch has spun more companies out of U.S. universities and national laboratories than any other venture capital firm. I've been involved in founding 30 companies um, over 23 years, including companies that are the standard of care in breast imaging, the leader in K through six mathematics, the leading genomics company, and Sapphire Energy the leader in algae biofuels. Uh, please, for a moment, imagine a world with oil made here in the USA with just CO2 and sunlight on desert land powering conventional cars and jets. Imagine a world where solar energy costs six to eight cents a kilowatt hour with no subsidy. That time is now. Those technologies exist today. And that innovation is happening in our research universities and labs and in startups, not in big companies. Big companies don't do that anymore, and they don't take the risks. This bottle of algae oil from Sapphire Energy has 200 patents behind it and $100 million of private capital just to start. It will compete with Exxon and the Middle East and China. Sapphire has a huge lead now because of U.S. innovation and patents, and we're hiring hundreds of people in New Mexico and California. Without those patents, no money would come, no plants, no jobs. With a strong world patent system and the right voluntary incentives for global cooperation, we can use this green crude to make poor, companies oil ex poor countries oil exporters. And we want to do that. I believe the only way to get to energy independence and solve global warming is through technology. Four to five inventions in the next one to 10 years will change everything. Algae biofuels at scale, solar, solar that competes on cost, new batteries, new lighting with 10x less electricity consumption. It will happen only in the U.S. Almost all the major breakthroughs in energy, in, in energy are happening here, not just 50 percent of the patents, but almost all the major breakthroughs, only because of strong IP protection, only because of huge private venture capital investments that follow federal research. Now imagine a world where we allow big oil to run over the innovators because of weakened patent laws and weak enforcement, where we accidentally harm our own clean industries by using compulsory licensing instead of incentives, where we increase taxes on investors who create new companies, jobs, and solve our policy goals, like reducing carbon. That could be our trajectory. The light at the end of the tunnel is this committee and others who are saying, wait a minute, policy goals actually matter. We need to support and reward the innovators. We need funding support for scale-up, and we need support in other committees of Congress so that we do not inadvertently and accidentally hurt energy innovation. We need the right policies and incentives for global cooperation so we can deploy our solutions rapidly to, to the world while still protecting jobs at home. We may even need something like a World Green Bank to help fund the deployment of green technologies in developing countries. Our greatest global competitive advantage in the next decade is energy innovation. Regardless of your position on global warming, we will lead the world in, in, in innovation, 
and we will become more secure as a result. Venture capital investment in energy is solely dependent on our patent system and international protection of intellectual property. Without that investment, we all lose. Without a healthy venture capital envir environment, our policies will fail. With policies that encourage that investment, we are more secure, more prosperous, and we will have a greener and cleaner environment for the benefit of the global community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, our next witness is uh, Ms. Uh, Jennifer Haverkamp, <coughs> who is Managing Director for International Policy and Negotiations at the Environmental Defense Fund. Previously, Ms. Haverkamp served for eight years as the Assistant U.S. Trade Representative, where she was responsible for reconciling uh, U.S. trade policy and environmental policy. Uh, she has uh, taught uh, international environmental law at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and we welcome you uh, here, Ms. Havikamp. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. It's an honor to be here with you today. Here's my message. Concerns about intellectual property rules are solvable problems. In fact, a strong climate policy will lead to a blossoming of new intellectual property. In my statement, I will make three points. Point one, the most important driver of U.S. technology development and U.S. competitiveness is a strong domestic climate policy. I know this is a hearing about intellectual property rights, but really, I think what we're talking about is our economic competitiveness, the concern that sharing our own clean tech overseas will let economic competitors get ahead by stealing our secrets. The truth is they don't need to steal our ideas to outcompete us in the new energy economy. They can simply seize the opportunity first. And Europe, Japan, and others are racing ahead right now when it comes to low carbon technologies. How do we get back in the game? By putting a cap on greenhouse gas emissions as this house has moved to do. That will create an enormous domestic market for low carbon technology. And the alternative is to sit tight and watch our foreign competitors take a commanding lead in the new energy economy. And that would be a terrible mistake. Think about this. China's seventh richest man, Xi Jinping, is worth $1.43 billion and is a low-carbon solar entrepreneur. And during 2008, China became the world's largest solar panel producer in the world, with 95% of its production destined for export. I brought one graphic, which my colleague will post there. Um, the chart reflects the geographic distribution of, US pa of patents around the world. And as Congresswoman Blackburn noted, the circle on the left, the green half of the circle, is U.S. patents from the years 2002 through 2008. We lead the world in clean energy patents, but we have a much smaller share of production, only 9% in 2005 for solar. The problem here isn't theft of our IP, it's that we don't have the right national policies. Of course, where valid concerns about IP exist, they must be addressed. But we're not going to build a clean energy economy just by having a lot of pieces of paper from the patent office. We need factories and installers, and we get that by putting a cap on carbon. Point two. In the UN climate negotiations, intellectual property discussions have so far displayed strong rhetoric but limited analytical basis. IP rights are becoming a real flashpoint in the UN climate negotiations where IP is one part of the broader issue of tax transfer. Over the years, developing countries have been promised and have had high hopes for tech transfer, but they've mostly been disappointed. As others have noted, the parties to the international negotiations hold sharply divergent perspectives on IPR. Many developing countries argue that IPR restricts their access to climate-friendly technology and seeks special treatment and relaxing of the rules. They see the situation as analogous to life-saving medications like those for HIV and AIDS. But there are big differences between pharmaceuticals and low-carbon technologies. Unlike pharmaceuticals, many of the tools necessary to reduce carbon emissions and adapt to a warmer planet are not leading-edge, unique solutions. They are existing technology, unprotected by patents, even in the developed world. Consider three main ways, ways of emissions reductions. The first, energy efficiency, typically involves things that don't require IP licenses putting up insulation, caulking air holes, installing more efficient windows, appliances, that sort. The second, clean energy production, likewise does not appear to be significantly hemmed in by patent protection. Many companies in different countries compete to offer renewal energy equipment. In wind, for instance, there are at least 20 different firms scattered in many countries competing to sell wind turbines. 
when a technology depends crucially on a single patent, such as a drug to he treat HIV and AIDS, this doesn't happen. Finally, consider a third way, sequestering carbon in farms and forests. To our knowledge, there are no exclusive rights, for example, in planting more trees, flooding rice paddies less often, or using less fertilizer. It's also important to remember that getting a patent, unlike copyrights, requires a time-consuming and often costly application process in each individual country. Thus, unless an inventor has obtained a patent in a particular country, he or she won't have any patent rights to enforce there. For these reasons, it's not clear whether there are enough IPR problems for climate-friendly technologies to support significant modifications or exceptions to the rules. It's also important to keep in mind when evaluating the developing countries' proposals in the UN negotiations that countries are in the midst of what has finally ripened into an actual negotiation, with parties ramping up their rhetoric and staking out strong positions in anticipation of future compromise. Point three, my last point. We need to be vigilant for emerging problems from either side of the issue, potential infringements of IPR rights or potential IPR barriers to technology access. As I've noted, the case remains to be made in favor of climate-specific modifications to the rules. The urgency of the climate problem demands, however, that climate-friendly technologies be widely available and that breakthrough innovations be quickly and widely disseminated. Accordingly, we must continue to monitor the situation and respond swiftly if IPR rules are found to be blocking effective tech transfer. But should that happen, the four that specialize in IPR rules, the World Intellectual Property Organization and the TRIPS Agreement, appear better positioned than the UN Climate Talks to address that issue. Just like to close by mentioning that cooperative research and development can play a crucial supporting role in tech transfer and the recently announced U.S.-China jointly funded Center for CCS Research is a good example of that. It helps set the stage for constructive U.N. negotiations toward the end that we must achieve, a global deal to reduce greenhouse gases from all major sources. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Haverkamp, very much. And our final witness uh, is Dr. Mark Esper, who is the Executive Vice President of the Global Intellectual Property Center and Vice President of the Europe and Eurasia Department of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Previously, Dr. Esper worked as a senior scholar at the National Institute for Public Policy. He also served as Executive Vice President of the Aerospace Industries Association of America. Uh, thank you, Dr. Esper, for joining us this morning. We look forward to your testimony. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Good. Thank you, sir. Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce's Global Intellectual Property Center and its members. The Global IP Center and its members believe that strong intellectual property rights are integral to driving the innovation and creativity necessary to create jobs, save lives, advance economic growth and development around the world, and generate breakthrough solutions to global challenges such as climate change. Our nation's founders recognized the link between strong IP rights and innovation more than 200 years ago and explicitly gave Congress the power to protect IP rights in the Constitution. As a result, America has led the world in innovation for generations. Today, today the United States IP is worth between five and five trillion dollars. IP accounts for more than half of all U.S. exports, helping drive 40 percent of the United States' economic growth. And as of 2008, IP-intensive industries employed more than 18 million Americans. But beyond driving job creation and economic growth, strong IP rights have created a secure framework for investment and research that led to solving some of the world's most difficult problems, from disease and famine to water scarcity and energy security, just to name a few. In addition to protecting and incentivizing inventors, strong IP rights are also integral to promoting technology deployment and diffusion by providing a clear legal framework by which companies can transact business. Despite these facts, threats to innovation and IP rights exist around the globe. In an effort to promote domestic industries or appeal to narrow political interests, some governments are actively engaged in attempts to weaken the current IP system. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is the latest front where some are attempting to portray IP rights as a barrier to solving climate change. The GIPC believes these critics have once again turned reality on its head. Robust IP rights are not an obstacle, as some allege, but instead play a fundamental role in encouraging innovative solutions to climate change, mitigation, and adaptation. IP protection also helps facilitate tech transfer by providing companies a commercial incentive to engage in foreign direct investment, joint ventures, co-production, cooperative research endeavors, and licensing agreements with local partners. There now is a clear commitment by the developing world 
to address global warming through some form of binding international agreement as either a negotiating tactic to block any international agreement or a condition that will be used to advance our own economic development and technological prowess, China, India, and other developing nations are using the issue of tech transfer as a major lever in current UN negotiations. As a result, among the options included with the current, within the current UN negotiating draft are is, uh, are, is language related to IPRs as uh, compulsory licensing, patent exclusions, and other exceptions for green technologies. Incorporating any of these proposals into the fi final UN agreement would not only have a negative impact on the development and diffusion of climate change mitigation and adaptation technologies, but would also put American workers and the U.S. economy at a competitive disadvantage. Some countries claim that IP rights are a major barrier to the diffusion of technology. Such claims are quite misleading. To begin, IP rights cannot be a barrier to tech transfer if the patents are not protected in the first place, which is often the case in many least developed countries. Ironically, one of the real barriers to tech diffusion is not strong IP rights, but the lack of them. Indeed, a report commissioned recently by the European Commission states that, quote, U.S. multinational companies are more active in engaging and transferring intangible assets to their own affiliates in the country if the country has strengthened its IP legislation. Another major obstacle to tech transfer is a country's absorptive capacity, meaning a country's ability to not only receive the technology, but then have the various means from physical to human capital to deploy and employ it effectively. Lack of access to capital in domestic and international markets is another barrier to tech transfer. Other obstacles to tech transfer are often self-imposed through tariff and non-tariff barriers. A 2008 report by the OECD stated that Brazil, Russia, India, and China have, quote, significant barriers to trade in carbon abatement technology, unquote, often, dis often imposing tariffs quoted above 10 percent on these technologies. A recent report by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce stated that, quote, many countries impose tariffs of up to 70 percent on climate-friendly goods and services, impeding access to cutting-edge technologies, unquote. Given the real and various seri very serious obstacles to tech transfer, a number of remedies are readily apparent. The United States could take a number of actions from, for example, urging developing countries to strengthen their IP laws and enforcement, working with countries in the developing world to also improve their absorptive capacity, and working with our trading partners and others in the developing world to remove all tariff and non-tariff non -tariff barriers to trade. These are just a few of my ideas. I included more in my written testimony, and we can discuss uh, additional ones later. But the fact is that technology development, deployment, and diffusion cannot be mandated. It is a long-term process that occurs largely and most effectively within the private sector along voluntary, commercially viable, and IP-compliant terms. The Global IP Center applauds the House of Representatives and its members who have taken a number of steps to ensure IP protection is a priority within the UNFCCC negotiations, particularly Ranking Member Sensenbrenner and Representatives Blackburn, Larson, and Kirk. As a re result of these efforts, there are currently three House-passed bills containing provisions aimed at protecting IP for green technologies. While the Chamber views these provisions as positive, enacting them does not guarantee that IP rights will be protected in Copenhagen, nor does it foreclose the likelihood that other nations may, down the road, seek to use the narrowly tailored exceptions in the current WTO agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights to expropriate IP-protected American innovations. As such, we believe it is critical that Congress continue to send the administration and our negotiating partners clear and forceful signals that IP rights is not an area where the United States is willing to make concessions at Copenhagen. Uh, let me wrap up, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, by saying that reduced global carbon emissions is a major challenge that will require many new technologies and unprecedented cooperation among the world's nations to achieve. At a time when job creation, economic growth, and problem solving are paramount, it's important that more than ever to protect an IP-based incentive system that has worked extremely well for centuries in driving innovation, developing solutions, and deploying those technologies as broadly as possible. The Congress has taken a number of positive and constructive steps in this direction, but more can and should be done if we are to be successful at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Esper, very much. Uh, we now recognize the uh, gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, in my opening statement, I refer to the current UN negotiating text at the Bonn meeting next month including proposals to, quote, exclude from patenting in developing countries environmentally sound technologies to adapt to or mitigate climate change. Uh, second, to require, quote, compulsory licensing for environmentally safe and sound technologies. 
Uh, third, to ensure, quote, access to intellectual property, protected technologies, and associated know-how to developing countries on non-exclusive royalty-free terms. Now, obviously, this goes directly opposite to what everybody said here. Um, what would be your recommendation to Mr. Stern and the U.S. negotiating team when they go to bomb next month on how to deal with this issue aside from saying that uh, what's in the text is a non-starter? And I open it up to anybody who wishes to take a crack at it first, but I'm going to ask the other members of the panel to amplify after whoever is the leadoff hitter. Mr. Nelson. I'll, I'll take a shot. Um, I, I do think you have to have an alternative um, other than just saying no. Um, one of the things I was looking at as a model is something like the Asian Development Bank, um, some possible private or uh, private public sector uh, incentive system, essentially. So for a developing country, if there's, a, if there's a breakthrough technology, that there's some way, it may be even modeled off the Green Bank here, that, that um, would incentivize U.S., primarily U.S. breakthrough technologies to go to developing countries and possibly loan guarantees or some other uh, way that kind of entices me instead of going uh, to another developed country to deploy my technology to deploy in developing countries, still with IPR protection. So I think that, you know, with, with the overarching um, goal being that the technologies are still proprietary and protected, but there's incentives to deploy versus disincentives. Personally, I think that it's going to be very hard because of the, num the amount of dollars that are going to be invested in, this in these technologies to deploy billions and billions. If, if there's not some kind of intellectual property rights there, then, then people won't do the investment in the developing countries. So we'll have exactly the opposite effect um, that the developing countries are thinking it will have. So some well, incentive structure. Uh, and Mr. Nelson, I appreciate that. The message that I got out of uh, our recent trip to China is either, quote, give us a compulsory license, or if you won't do that, we'll just steal the technology anyhow. Now, either alternative, one which is legal and one which is not, would mean that the actual manufacture of the technologies that were developed as a result of American innovation would not be made by American workers for use in third world countries. Uh, how do we solve that problem? Because I think we're, we want to develop jobs here in this industry and uh, with either the compulsory license or else attitude that we heard in China, uh, we'll be developing the technologies, but the Chinese will be using their workers and playing them slave labor wages, so they'll end up monopolizing the market. I think we can do both. So I think there's plenty of incentives that are being created here at home to be able to deploy green technologies. And I actually think, that, again, the Green Bank is, is, is one way of, of kind of getting some incentives for things to stay here. Um, so at least with this oil, you know, this is, we're going we're gonna to start in Texas and Oklahoma and New Mexico and, and, and other places. But, but it, does, it isn't necessarily a loss for us if China makes this oil under the right construct, right? If, if China is making domestic oil, um, that means they're probably interfering in less things outside of China and Africa and, and, and other, other places. So it might not be a bad thing. I personally think it, it, with China it is, a, is a different case than some of the other developing countries. So I think it really needs to be dealt with at a high level, probably in some kind of an SED construct or, or some specific uh, government to government um, uh, relationships where, the, where IPR is, is, is really addressed at, a, at an extremely high level. I mean, at least from when we're making our business decisions about China right now, we're waiting. And we're waiting for government help, um, and we're waiting probably to try to get China to invest some of their own uh, foreign, foreign reserve in things like this so that, that they feel invested and that we feel protected. Uh, that's, that's a big problem, because if they can get it free, why would they invest their money in that rather than something else? I think I've made my point, so uh, my time is up, so thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you, gentlemen. Time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. This is a little bit off topic, but we had some discussion yesterday about some multiple technologies. And I want to ask Mr. Nelson, there was a question asked yesterday about the relative uh, prospects of two paths for transportation fuels, one of a solar-powered, electrical-powered vehicle transportation system, and an alternative or adjunct path of a solar-powered photosynthetic biofuels path to a transportation system. And the gentleman who was talking was comparing the relative efficiencies of photosynthesis to photovoltaic or concentrated solar systems. And I just wonder if you want to comment on that, Mr. Nelson, on your view on how we should look at those two potential paths. Uh, just real briefly, I, I think that um, there are going to be multiple solutions, so they're, they're not substitutes for each other, but I think people often confuse um, electricity um, with transportation fuel. So really, if you're, if you're comparing a transportation fuel to something, you need to compare it to a battery that stores electricity. You can't compare solar photovoltaics to a transportation fuel. So basically, you have to say it's a gallon of gas compared to a battery. And right now, a gallon of gas is 200 times more dense than the best battery. So, so if you have a, a battery that equals a gallon of gas and it was a Duracell battery, it would be nine feet high. So, so far, um, there isn't anything that replaces most transportation fuels. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rao, when we were in uh, Hong Kong, or north of Hong Kong, we saw an American company, Ceres, doing work on some um, LED lighting developments. And as I understand it, they intend to do some manufacturing in China. What, what's your current view if, uh, of the relationship of your intellectual property in a China context? Just what, what do you view the current status of that is? How confident would you be uh, of manufacturing in China or allowing that intellectual property to be available? With, with respect to the LED technology, sir, um, we have been waiting for that particular reason uh, because our confidence level wasn't too high. Um, however, uh, we have seen technologies grow in China and take advantage of the massive local market. At the end of the day, they are able to invest in manufacturing in China if they are able to create ma the market in China. And we are finding low-cost options for LED technology coming from China and we're beginning to have conversations with people to actually either cross-license or work together. Um, it's been, and as Mr. Nelson mentioned here, uh, most of them here, most of us here in the U.S. are in a, in a wait-and-see approach as to what happens in, in places like China. In the meantime, however, their markets are growing at a much rapid pace. They are, they are not waiting for people like us to come in. They're getting it, as, as Mr. Sensen better mentioned before, they're taking it one way or the other and will continue doing that, whether it's through their own schools and universities or whether it's through partnerships. So that's why I brought up the sense of urgency here for us to move forward. Uh, if we don't take the action and create some kind of a mechanism on the commercial side to take advantage of our technologies and our IP, then I believe we will be left behind, So, which is one reason why we are jumping ahead and having those conversations. Are we very confident of protecting our IP in China? No. Uh, but is that the reason not to do anything? I don't believe so either. So I'm not quite sure what the exact answer is, but we'll have to get out there and start putting our technology out there so it leads the world. Most of the core technologies in, in demand side, whether it's LED lighting or not, is here today to, to lower our energy consumption. If we, as, as, as American enterprise, are able to get out there and, and make that lead and, and have other countries and companies follow, I think we will continue to stay in the leadership. So do you look at yourself as sort of be between a rock and a hard place? If you wait and you allow other companies to develop these markets in China, you're left in the starting gate. If you move to China now, you could lose your intellectual property. Is that, is that the conundrum you're in? That, that is exactly. You, you said it very eloquently. It's a conundrum that we're in. So, so people will look for alternatives, whether it's Thailand or, or Indonesia, where there's more of a perceived protection of IP. I'm not quite sure if it's true or not, but it is less of a flow. Or what we do is we keep Gen 1 products here in the U.S., and maybe the older technology, we take it to other parts of the world so you don't lose your current technology. The other thing about being between a rock and a hard place uh, is, or is the fact that um, if we are able to create markets here locally, 
we can stimulate innovation at a much more rapid play, uh, way. I mean, that's one thing that's keeping us behind. I think a couple of us mentioned here, we are slow to create markets in energy and climate-related technologies here in the US. That will be our number one challenge. If we don't do that, we will be left behind. But China and India and the Middle East are doing that today. Well, we have a little bill we hope becomes law this fall that will help in that regard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Nelson, are, are you uh, at all familiar with uh, the Midwest Research Institute? Yeah, uh, n n just generally. Um, the the Midwest uh, Research Institute, MRI, has a, a division called Solar Tech, and uh, it, it serves as a neutral place uh, when companies, uh, research organizations, or, or utilities uh, can uh, collaborate on a common uh, challenge and conduct uh, proprietary uh, research necessary to be successful. I'm wondering whether or not uh, you think it would be feasible for us uh, in, in some future legislation uh, to uh, award incentives uh, to companies that create um, neutral uh, places uh, as a part of their U.S. marketing strategy. Well, I, th I think know, I mean where where people where they can where where the, the uh, innovators can come to to make sure that there is a neutral party uh, to to kind of manage, oversee, negotiate uh, to to prevent. Uh, thievery. I mean, I think that's a good idea in the U.S. I think um, when you talk about exporting ideas like that globally, I think it's a great idea to have applications development or, or you know, the, you mentioned uh, a place, in, a joint effort we're doing with China. There's some things in Europe. There's, there's a lot of interesting ways we can think about ideas like that on, on, a, on a global basis focused on applications. I think um, my point earlier was that most of the br big breakthroughs are still going to happen in the U.S. So we have to do two things. We have to protect the big breakthroughs, and then we have to develop the applications. And I think when you talk about these kind of joint research institutes and potential kind of neutral ground, those are better for the applications than they are for the breakthroughs. Because no matter what you do in foreign countries, you won't be able to replicate the trillion or two trillion dollar investment the U.S. has in our research infrastructure that is pretty much not duplicatable anywhere else in the world. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Haverkamp, uh, you mentioned uh, the, the benefits of including international uh, allowances and offsets in the uh, Waxman Market Climate Bill, which uh, we proudly passed over here in the House. Um, and if we could figure out a way to eliminate the Senate uh, constitutionally, uh, I think we could uh, make a lot of progress. But that, that's just a personal opinion. Uh, but uh, you, you also mentioned that the Kyoto Protocol's uh, international offset program, the Clean Development uh, Mechanism, uh, has not lived up to expectations. Uh, what can you share with this committee uh, that might um, improve our international uh, offset program before uh, the, the, the final passage of, of our uh, Waxman-Markey bill? Thank you for the question. Um, I think what, what is especially important is that the international offsets that are allowed to be used by U.S. companies uh, satisfy scientific requirements for their environmental integrity and I think the bill proposes a process for that happening. Um, there are some kinds of offsets like uh, the uh, reductions in deforestation from f tropical forest countries that you can be sure are keeping carbon out of the atmosphere and the bill in a very good way uh, creates a lot of space for deforestation credits to come into the system. With respect to emissions reductions from projects in developing countries along the lines of the clean development mechanism, uh, I think there are a couple things that, that, that should happen. One is uh, to 
make these reductions happen at a greater scale is to move to more broader what are called sectoral crediting where you're trying to achieve reductions across an entire industrial sector rather than a particular facility. Um, I think the other thing that I think that the bill does which I which I applaud is that while preserving the clean development mechanism projects for the smaller poorer countries it has a mechanism for the largest emitters graduating out of the ability to sell their credits into our market. And I think that's especially important for the atmosphere because the major emitting developing countries need to move as soon as they can toward real emissions reductions. And CDM projects are frankly shifting emissions from one part of the world to another rather than an overall reduction globally in emissions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Asper, um, do you think that uh, further nation-to-nation -nation collaboration such as the U.S. and China are doing on carbon capture and, and sequestration uh, or uh, promises for future uh, collaboration uh, will significantly, significantly help negotiations with developing nations uh, at Copenhagen? Well, I think it's important that we continue to engage China on this issue. Um, but for the purposes of intellectual property, I think we, we do need to be very clear up front with the Chinese. And in, in some ways, as they've claimed leadership of the G77 bloc, is to, to make clear that IPRs are all off the table with regard to, uh, with regard to climate change agreement. Because at the end of the day, as, as several of us noted, and, and uh, the chairman and the ranking member have noted, if, if we don't protect the intellectual property rights, then we won't drive the innovation that's going to get us to the solutions. And so I, I think it's critical that we continue the, to engage the Chinese, but be, be very clear and forceful up front that, that IP isn't on the table when it comes to uh, addressing climate change. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. We thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Rao, uh, in your testimony, you point to the tremendous business opportunities across the world for clean technology. Uh, could you... Uh, Tell us in more detail about the experiences you personally had meeting uh, this demand with your products. Sure, Chairman. Thank you for the question. Um, specifically, I'll talk about um, the Middle East, but I'll also expand that to Southeast Asia and China, where we have been having discussions. This is fresh in my mind, so I can talk about that. And tell us about the barriers that you encountered, too, Ex please. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the, this pertains specifically to energy and um, in, in the aspect of demand uh, containment, so demand side management in terms of lighting, uh, digital lighting, so LED lighting and controls. Um, there are opportunities in these countries where they've recognized that uh, controlling their use of energy is going to be a lot faster than just adopting um, energy generation technologies. As an example, in the Middle East, using solar um, photovoltaic technology is not going to be practical because of um, dust settling into solar panels. And, and so they've tried it. Um, you know, we blindly believe that uh, there is a lot of sun in the Middle East, so solar would be great. Well, actually, practically on the ground, it does not seem to be all that, all that fine. So well, would, th would that be the same problem in the Mojave Desert? in the United States? If dust, if dust would settle in and as a result that that's a false promise as well? It, I'm not sure if I'm qualified to, to technically answer the question without a little bit more research, Chairman, but I'll tell you this. If it's dust with moisture, if the humidity content is high in the Mojave Desert, which I believe it's not, at least for most of the year, that becomes an issue because the dust with humidity settles in and cakes in on these panels does actually putting a barrier between the, in the sun, sun rays and the actual photovoltaic cells. So we're lucky there's no humidity in the Mojave Desert? I believe so. As a result, so. we can become the solar giant because of that, and, and all across the Middle East, no matter whether it's 100 degrees a day and the sun is out every single day, that solar is not in their future? Is that what you're saying? Because of the humidity that accompanies the dust uh, and the sun in the Middle East? In, for the moment, Mr. Chairman, that is the reality as they have tried and tested. However, I'm wow. hoping... Go ahead. No, I'm just saying, wow, I did not just... know how, you know, really up the creek 
uh, the Middle Eastern countries are because of their yes. the humidity <laughs> accompanying that. I never knew that. And, and they are looking for solutions. So talk about technology and opportunity for innovation. If we can solve the problem of, of dust and humidity settling in, the same thing happens with outdoor LED lighting where the brightness of these fixtures are reduced at least by 40 to 50 percent because of the film of dust that gets caked in. So we're taking that on as a challenge to resolve those issues. Well, that's on the, on, the, on, the, on the energy side. On the control side and, and LED lighting interior, I believe there are tremendous opportunities. As an example, in built environments, today with technologies that exist here in the U.S. and elsewhere, we can reduce the energy usage by at least 40 percent without major infrastructure change. They have recognized that and they have asked us to help them with implementation of this technology. So that's a specific examples. So if you talk about controls, what am I talking about specifically? Making built environments more intelligent that actually regulate the lighting, the HVAC, et cetera, based on ambient conditions of out, outside lighting as well as outside temperature. In, in very often we find in, in commercial buildings or in other places as well, the outside temperature is 110 degrees but the inside temperature and the air conditioning is ramped down to 65 degrees. It really, and we've actually been in environments where you feel cold inside when it's 110 degrees outside. The difference doesn't have to be that much to provide comfort to, for us as human beings to be inside. So making it intelligent actually adds tremendous amount of savings. That is something that we ought to be doing here in the U.S. And people outside the U.S. in the Middle East and Southeast Asia have recognized that as well. They're beginning to implement those technologies. Now, let me ask Mr. Nelson a question. You, you, you talk about the uh, U.S. Green Bank as a good, alter, as a good idea uh, to help to finance uh, new green technologies. Uh, but you also pointed to the idea of a world green bank. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how you would see that structured and how you would see the technology transfer uh, occur in that kind of a context? I think, um, I think the structure would be similar in the sense that it's really an incentive, um, an incentive process, right? So if you have a developing area, they could essentially partner with a private companies and then apply for funding um, from this entity, whether it was a private entity or a public entity. And something like the Asian Development Bank would be would be a good example of something that exists um, outside of the, the U.S. Um, proposed Green Bank. So, so if I wanted to make a uh, million acre algae biofuels facility in a poor country in Africa, I would approach the country and we would jointly apply to a, an entity that would help partially fund it intellectual property rights being preserved, not actually transferring the technology to anybody, but a kind of a joint uh, effort that, that would have uh, some public funding. And then with China, I think it's a little bit different, so it needs to go in at a probably a different level. And I actually think maybe the solution would be to have the Chinese uh, put up some of their uh, excess money uh, in, into, those, into the, that kind of a structure so they feel invested. So when, they, when the Chinese say they don't have any excess money, and as a result we should be giving them these technologies, what is our best answer to them about, the, uh, about I don't know. I mean, about I, this debate over whether or not they have excess money? I sat on a panel um, recently uh, with the uh, uh, person that's directing the uh, Social Security Fund in, in China and the, uh, and the other person that happens to be uh, in charge of the China Investment Corporation. And, and they have um, a large amount of, of uh, money. And I think that um, one of our challenges to China um, and one of the ways to solve this problem is to get them invested, right? I mean, if, if they are investing billions and billions of dollars in U.S. technology that is deployed in China um, and intellectual property rights are preserved in a government-to-government -government relation, that actually might work because it's it's less likely that they're going to want to steal the technology if they've invested huge amounts of money in it. Got it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If, uh, Very, yeah. I, I was going to say, if I can add, I I think China is is a special case. And, and going back to the idea of the green bank, you know, the demand is that the developed countries would put make contributions to the bank, from which, as the example was pointed out, the developing countries could draw from. But I think it's, it's uh, putting the onus on the developed countries is only half of the equation. The other half is, is addressing the tariff and non-tariff barriers. It, it doesn't make much sense to contribute to the bank and allow 
companies or countries to draw from this, but then paying exorbitantly high uh, tariff rates and confronting the other problems. China is, is even more different because in that case, not only do you have the, the tariff issues and non-tariff issues that you face, but in China, we also know that the, um, that the government has identified renewable energy as a strategic industry. So they have, in addition to tariff and non-tariff barriers, other types of protectionist measures, whether it's uh, local content requirements, uh, IP issues, that really um, are, are really aimed at uh, improving their own economic competitiveness and their technological skills. So it's a special case that we really have to work on uh, in particular if we're going to break down these barriers and get them to, to be a responsible player in, in addressing climate change. Okay. Thank you, um, Dr. Esper, very much. Gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. Dr. Esper, could you talk about those tariff barriers right now, where they exist, the amounts, what, if anything, we've do, done about them? Are there pockets of the worst offenders? Well, we have some specific examples. Um, um, I think I cited in my written testimony countries such as the Philippines, China, others, where you have tar tariff rates at, at least as high as 10 percent, in some cases higher. You have other type of non-tariff barriers that could equal 300 um, percent in terms of a, a, a tariff equivalent. So it's, um, it's, it's a big challenge when countries put those types of obstacles in front of tech transfer. Uh, that's what we say when we, rather than talking about IP and how we do compulsory licensing or, or tech transfer in the UNFCCC context, we really need to not focus on the red herring and look at what the real obstacles are at the country by country level and tackle those. So let's, let's just take the Philippines, just because you've mentioned them. Um, have we made any significant efforts on, on those tariff barriers for, for IP? You say there's like a 10 percent. I mean, we're, we're investing gazillions of dollars in security training people in the Philippines, right. it's kind of hard to accept that tariff barrier against our sales to them of high-tech material and systems. Have, have we made any serious attempt there, for instance? Well, that's, it's a good question, and I don't have the answer for it right now. I, I think it's part and parcel of the, the strategy we need to put forward <clears throat> in terms of addressing the tech transfer issue of looking at these countries, looking at where they rank on the special 301 watch lists, and asking ourselves, how do we, how do we uh, um, talk to them and how do we engage them in a way that will get them to reduce these tariff barriers? What levers can we use, either diplomatically, uh, through uh, uh, financial assistance, foreign assistance, whatever the case may be, to get them to uh, address these issues, to comport with uh, international IP laws, and to strengthen their IP enforcement? Uh, Mr. Nelson, you, were, you had an idea about the green banks, like the idea of maybe using a green bank in an international context. But you also suggested one solution is to have other companies be invested, so they've got a, an investment in it where they benefit, if you will, from IP protection. Are those mutually inconsistent at all that, you know, we're helping finance through Green Bank, but then we're also expecting people to be personally invested? I, I'm I, think, I think you define it based on poor countries versus, uh, versus wealthier countries. So there are developing countries that have large foreign currency reserves, so, uh, one, you know, China being the obvious. So I think China is a, China and India and, and maybe one or two other Asian countries are separate cases. And then you have issues like Africa and, and um, other places where basically there isn't money and, and so you need to probably have some kind of private sector, public sector matching or similar, uh, s some quasi um, public structure like the Asia, Asian Development Bank Right. where there's maybe or maybe multiple different um, organizations coming together to do project finance um, that has some private matching. Just to share my story from China to show I'm thinking that on the lines you are is that when we were meeting with the Chinese officials and the same line with remarkable message uh, discipline, everyone told us the same story in China, which is that they are a developing nation. We are a developing nation. We are a developing nation. And I was with one of the officials, I noted that in driving to the, to the meeting with him, we'd gone by two Gucci stores, a Prada store, and a Ferrari dealership. And I noted that just that morning, a Chinese businessman had bought a stake in the Cleveland Cavaliers. And I said that I thought China was a developing nation just as much as Yao Yuming is a developing basketball player. And so I kind of share your view in that regard. Well, one of the things I've, I've noted in, in my dealings with China, um, has been that 
I think they are looking for the right technologies, just as we are. Once the green technologies that actually can compete on cost exist, I think they will absolutely invest their money in it. And, and so as you see solar come down and as you see biofuels that are practical, um, it's the same process that we have here. I mean, they're going to be marginally impactful until they can compete on cost. And then I believe we will invest more, and I believe China actually will want to invest some of their foreign currency in those solutions. And that's probably actually a good thing for us in a lot of ways. But we're still going to need to go high in um, maybe at an SED level for, for IP protection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rao, I want to, I really want to come back to this uh, in, inability of the Middle East to produce any solar. Because as you know, it's necessitating us selling nuclear power plants to countries in the Middle East the, with uranium, plutonium, and other nuclear bomb making material, uh, which is only going to escalate the, the tensions in the Middle East. And I'm very afraid that as we send uh, very expensive uh, nuclear power plants uh, to the Middle East uh, that were only uh, shortening the day that we have to send ever more troops over there uh, as a government collapses that has one of these nuclear power plants. Uh, in the same way that in Iran and Iraq we're now facing that problem, it's almost inevitable that the same thing will occur in one of these other countries, a country that could otherwise generate electricity from solar. So here's what I'm wondering. and. Everyone's gone here, so I'm all alone as the chairman. And I'm just wondering, you know, we had this problem with uh, rain that used to go on the windshields of American cars. And, and uh, somebody came up with the idea of a windshield wiper that would just wipe off, basically. And then somebody came up with a brilliant, brilliant idea. It was called the uh, intermittent windshield wiper. It would just occur every, you know, 30 seconds or so big patent fight over that well, 50 years ago in the United States. Guy got very rich winning this patent fight, big, big fight. And, and it just seems to me that maybe someone could invent a way that intermittently, the, since the, the very device that we're trying to protect generates electricity, it would seem that perhaps there would be a way to have an intermittent dust wiper, you know, wipe off the, the dust. Uh, so that the electricity which is being generated by the thing that's being protected by the intermittent dust wiper uh, would allow this country to be able to take advantage of their better natural resource rather than asking the United States to send them uranium and plutonium. Should I get a patent on my idea, Mr. <laughs> Ralph? And it, it would, would, would this idea emanating from this chair right now constitute constructive notice to all other entrepreneurs in the world that I have the idea first. Uh, and how much more complicated than that should it be to be able to figure this out? Um, a couple of comments, Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think it's an excellent idea. And uh, the, the, the only consolation is you probably um, uh, are repeating what, was ha what happened at a workshop three days ago in, in Bahrain about finding alternatives for self-cleaning solar panels that actually actually can do the same thing. Oh, we, we did recognize the fact that there was a patent fight, and, and the <laughs> in discussion was we have to do more research on who holds the patents on intermittent wipers and how it can be applicable to solar panels and outdoor. Out you actually had that conversation? Absolutely. It was a, it was a no <laughs> <way>. conversation. Oh. <laughs> oh. So, I, I'm a little, but you know what? There may be an extension if you really look at IP and say we will note that we actually had the conversation here in terms of actually bringing it. The, the, because we were looking because, for you know, solutions. There was a part of me, you know, that really, from a nationalistic perspective, that I thought maybe I shouldn't share this idea <laughs> with Bahrain and Saudi Arabia and other countries. Maybe I should just keep it here so that we develop all these ideas and that they not become the capital of solar, okay? Because we now have them, because they don't know about this, buying our nuclear power plants, huh? <laughs> and, and, and that's a good trade advantage for us. But maybe just out of, you know, and uh, Ms. Uh, Haverkamp already pointed this, uh, this out, and I think Mr. Nelson as well, maybe there's other reasons we should share the intermittent dust wiper technology with these other countries uh, so they can uh, capture the opportunities there. But, but uh, 
uh, I, I just think it sounds like an eminently solvable problem, uh, and it also solves the problem of us sending uranium and petroleum to countries that uh, could be subject to political instability over the next 50 years, uh, and which instability would then create um, uh, uh, real problems for us as well in the transfer of nuclear bomb-making material to uh, third world groups that many of these countries, as you know, are already subsidizing, Correct. Uh, uh, at least indirectly. So uh, I just think the, the sooner we solve this problem, and, um, and, and uh, I would like to work on this uh, as an issue, because I think almost everyone at this table really does believe that solar is the future, and it could become the single largest manufacturing sector in the history of the world. And I would just hate to see the countries with the most sun not being able to benefit from it because they don't understand the intermittent, intermittent uh, 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 windshield wiper technology better. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's an excellent idea. In fact, I think what uh, the, the folks in Bahrain and the Middle East are looking at is not a solar, it's just one option. It is one of several options. So, for example, they're exploring wind simultaneously as well, while I said, and they're also curtailing the use of, of, of energy itself. Uh, they are grossly negligent about how they use energy because it's so, it's so cheap. Now they begin to realize that. So we, we will work on that. I really applaud you for, for taking that effort. And maybe there is an idea for another patent, maybe if you continue thinking is, on that. Is this a patent in the, in the control of the United States? Are you aware of that? that uh, I am, is, the, is the workshop, the three-day workshop on the intermittent dust <laughs> removal technology, is that an American technology they, they were discussing? The, uh, the initial patents, I believe, where we're doing some research on it, the workshop wasn't on intermittent wipers. The workshop was on energy solutions as a whole. This was one aspect of it. So we have started doing research. It is about 48 hours since my last discussion on that. And I've been on a plane for 26 out of those. No, so we will, I, we'll get, we will get that research done I thank as well. You. you know, a lot of times people say, well, you know, this is the equivalent of our putting a, a man on the moon. Um, but in a lot of ways, that kind of overstates the case because we're talking about batteries. We're talking about, you know, uh, incremental additions on already existing technologies with, that with additional breakthroughs, kind of like the, in the chip industry, how there's Moore's Law and it just keeps improving every year or so, you know, that the same thing is true here with the incremental new technology breakthroughs that keeps... Uh, they keep improving by another 18 percent per year the efficiency of solar or wind or other technologies which seems to be the curb that at least solar has been on since 1978 so that's you know the uh, the context in which i'm you know thinking about these uh, issues maybe you could uh miss haverkamp talk a little bit about the difference between the hiv aids uh you know patent protections and the clean energy uh, patent protections, as you see the differences uh, in uh, other countries around the world in terms of those technology transfer issues. Sure, my pleasure. Um, I went into this in some more detail in my written testimony than I did orally, and uh, I recommend that people also look to that. But I think that some of the most significant differences are that often in the pharmaceutical area, to deal with a particular disease, there may be just one fix that's developed, one drug that really works. There's a lot of effort to find the one thing, the silver bullet, if you will. And what uh, people are fond of saying is that with respect to climate change, it's not going to be a silver bullet, it's going to be silver buckshot. And the examples that you see, say, in the solar area or the wind area, where there are lots of different companies with lots of different ways of addressing the problem of reducing emissions or making the products more efficient, that's quite different from the medicine area. Um, but I, I do think it's uh, important, and thinking back to uh, Representative Sensenbrenner's question about the negotiations, there's a lot of baggage from the pharmaceuticals debate that countries bring to the climate debate. So what is that baggage? Um, I think it was a sense that with the, in the pharmaceutical area, um, there were, it was more monopolistic situation with a few large companies that were making, ex they had to make incredible investments in the research to uh, develop these products, but then there were significant um, financial benefits when you had that patent, and there was a fair amount of obvious human misery that could be avoided if the medicines could be made available more cheaply. And it was, um, 
this is getting into anecdotal information, but I think one of the stories that I, I remember being bandied about a lot was that when the patent was about to expire, a minor change to the product could extend the patent period again. So it was looking like it was um, companies going out of their way to preserve their, preserve their market share and make it harder for generics to come online. And I think in the area of human health, that was, was um, seen by many developing countries as, as unacceptable. The good news is that, that in the uh, Doha WTO ministerial, the governments got together and came up with a decision about access to medicines that recognized that there were flexibilities in the TRIPS agreement, and in situations like this, they really ought to be used. Okay. So in the, um, uh, in the uh, uh, negotiations on international uh, climate uh, agreement, uh, intellectual property is one of the uh, four main pillars of the, of the negotiation. Why is it important for the United States to be a leader in resolving these issues, in your mm -hmm. opinion? I would slightly amend your description of intellectual property as one of the four main pillars. One of the four main pillars is the transfer of technology. Uh -huh. And intellectual property is one piece of that, but transfer of technology involves also the capacity building, the access to information, a whole suite of issues. And transfer of technology and addressing that is critical to getting a, an agreement in Copenhagen because it is, if you will, the developing countries' side of the, of the deal that we need to make. We are wanting them to reduce their emissions. They are wanting the technology and financial assistance to be able to do that. And it's in our self-interest at the United States to come up with solutions in the tech transfer area because, as many people have said, even if our emissions went to zero, if all the developed country emissions went to zero by 2050, you aren't going to avoid dangerous climate change unless the major developing countries soon also get their emissions leveled off and in a downward path. And so we, we need to find the ways to share technology, share know-how with them so that they can do that as well. And I think the private uh, carbon market can be a big player in making that happen. All right, so that we can have the audience watching on television understand it. What, what does TRIPS actually stand for so that we can bring them <laughs> into this discussion? What does TRIPS actually mean? I'm going to mean? trip over this. Um, Trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. Okay. And, uh, and that is the most important agreement in, in the intellectual, international, in, uh, intellectual property area, would you say? Um, well, the intellectual property provisions have gone into a lot of bilateral agreements, and well before TRIPS was put into... When the, was TRIPS put into? It was as part of the Uruguay round, which was um, in 1994-95 when the WTO agreements entered into force. But before that, there was a, a range of uh, agreements around intellectual property that are administered by the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. But I think TRIPS has been considered the most significant in creating the incentive for countries to establish strong intellectual property regimes in their domestic law. So, so how does uh, TRIPS, as administered by WIPO, um, mm. uh, impact on the clean technology transfer area? If you can put that into English for our <laughs> viewing audience. Um, I'm, I'm sure my colleague would like to help as well, but I think that, that one way to say it is that the TRIPS agreement, when countries join the WTO, they take on an obligation to uh, write into their domestic law strong intellectual property protections. And if countries do not uh, pass those laws or if they don't enforce those laws, then countries who are hurt by that can bring enforcement actions in the WTO to, to uh, compel them to uh, establish a good intellectual property protection regime. Which, in your opinion, is the best place to address the intellectual property issues related to climate change, Ms. Haverkamp? Then I'll ask you, Dr. Esper. Sure. Um, well, I think my first caveat would be that I think that the picture is still emerging of how significant these issues are and whether and what kind of fixes might be needed. But I think that climate change is a problem that requires 
that needs to be addressed across multiple fora, and the UN climate negotiations is not, does not have the sufficient expertise or involvement of all the right ministries to address all the issues. So I think that the IPR issues are coming up here, but it may well be, depending on the kind of uh, concerns that emerge, that the other fora, like the WTO uh, TRIPS agreement, would be um, an appropriate place to address it. I think also that's just a political reality, that I don't think um, you're going to get consensus to address these problems in the climate negotiations. Uh -huh. Dr. Esper. It, it's a good question. I was in Geneva a few weeks ago, and, and this issue has been uh, debated back and forth for some time now um, between the WTO and the WIPO and the UNFCCC. And I think they're, uh, my sense is they're coming to some conclusion, which we fully support, that uh, the WIPO is the best place to handle IP issues for the reasons that uh, uh, my colleague cited, everything from the expertise, the capacity, the ability to bring to bear all the different um, uh, parties to the, uh, to the agreement and to be able to address and consider any unintended consequences. Uh, this is one area where the WHO has already acknowledged that, uh, that uh, they believe in the, w in the health and health care uh, venue that uh, the WIPO, the Intellectual Property Organization, would have, uh, would take the lead. So our view has been that uh, IP is best handled in the WIPO. But going back to your original question, I, I think the issue really is about tech transfer, not about IP. It, it just tends to be the case that for one reason or another, uh, some governments, some NGOs jumped immediately on the IP issue and cited that as the problem. And I think as I pointed out in my testimony, others have as well, that IP isn't the obstacle here. It's what's going to get us innovation. If you, when you start looking through the case-by-case, country-by-country uh, examples, you find that certainly in the least developed countries, patents aren't the problem. Many of the technology solutions aren't patented. Uh, reforestation is certainly something that's not patented. But when you start moving up the ladder in terms of developing countries, that's where it gets a little bit trickier as country, as, as they may need different types of technologies. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Um, Mr. Rao. Mr. Chairman, uh, I have a slightly different uh, view on that. I'll, I'll, I'm actually given the details in the testimony of uh, um, an idea. The, the TRIPS is administered by WIPO. And uh, TRIPS, by default, actually talks about the trade-related aspects of, of IP. Um, it, perhaps it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to actually make this a trade issue, because at the end of the day, IP without commercialization doesn't really mean much. IP for the sake of IP is not going to get us anywhere. So if it's trade-related... You don't know how, as a history major, you know, all history and English majors in college envy the kids who are the science majors and the technology majors because they know what they want to do. And we're just taking satisfaction in these history and English books that we're reading. And here, for just one brief moment, it only lasted until I recognized you again. I really, I, I got great satisfaction. So sometimes IP, just for the sake of IP, does really <laughs> serve a purpose. Okay? It only lasted a very transitory moment. But I don't want you to underestimate the the satisfaction I felt as a history major, yeah, thank you, you know, having that big breakthrough. Well, perhaps maybe uh, in, in the, in the um, vein of uh, Hyde's law and, and other laws, maybe we have a Marquis law on intermittent cleaning of, uh, wind of uh, solar panels at some point. So and that, intermittent satisfaction from coming up with from that. From coming up with it, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I actually was talking about, about um, taking a different approach to IP instead of actually having this for the sake of IP internationally. Maybe uh, in conjunction with what uh, Mr. Nelson was talking about here, in terms of having an IP clearinghouse as an exchange, um, it actually has been tried by the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. They call it an eco patent uh, pooling, but they don't uh, incentivize the innovators. Um, it's more just to share ideas. But the clearinghouse I was talking about actually does incentivize, and this is exclusively for climate change related technologies, not across the board. You take this out of this realm of debate, because while we are debating, we are polluting. We are actually making this a more of a worse of a place. So uh, my idea was actually if you add this, this green bank, uh, it was actually, I called it funding, but make this a part of the WTO effort where the clearinghouse actually takes responsibility. You pay for play. You get in. If you have an idea, you get in, and you can actually take, an, I, I, I take IP as well. It lets innovators actually take advantage of ideas around the world. 
The interesting thing is it's not about the large companies alone. I think the backbone of our economy and, and most other economies is what I call the SMEs, the small and medium enterprises. Innovation comes out of there and providing them with access to ideas and incentives for getting new ideas and innovation is going to make a difference for us to create jobs here as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Nelson. Um, yeah, I think as long as it's not compulsory, the, those kind of exchanges work, but for the real big breakthroughs, which are the ones that are actually going to matter to us, you know, all, all the incremental stuff added up will not get you to solar that competes with existing electricity. There needs to be major innovative breakthroughs, and those are happening, but those people probably won't want to put those in. And one final point, the difference between the HIV issue and what we're talking about is, is the R&D costs are great on both. But the deployment cost on these energy solutions is very large. So one biofuels plant that's just a demonstration plant in the U.S. costs more than the total manufacturing costs of all the HIV drugs that have been distributed in Africa. So, so it's, it's a very different, completely different um, equation. I was only making reference to a hearing that we had yesterday. Um, with uh, Dr. Emmanuel Sachs, who is the was an MIT professor who created the technology that led to the creation of the company Evergreen uh, Solar Company. And what he did was he presented us a chart which showed how the, the cost of uh, generating a kilowatt hour from solar had dropped from $5 down now to about 20 cents. Uh, and that it improves about 18 percent per year technologically. And that with his new company, uh, 1366, uh, which is a new company in Lexington, Massachusetts, with his new state-of-the-art technology, making an additional uh, improvement, that he sees actually by the year 2020 that uh, uh, the generation of electricity from PV will be uh, equivalent to that of coal and that by 2020 uh, we can expect that 7 percent of the electricity in the world will be generated from uh, photovoltaic uh, technology. Now you look at that, Mr. Nelson, and, uh, and your response would be? My response would be that it's a good news response, was that um, we have a company that's going on sun at uh, NREL in a week that will probably do six to eight cents a kilowatt hour. So, so uh, you don't have to wait 20 years. We don't have to wait 20 years. Well, no, he's saying that we will actually see uh, by 2027 percent of all electricity. Yeah, I, I in the actually world. think. I actually do you think, think. You think that that? Do you think that's a realistic goal? Once you get it down to. I, I think it's, it's all about cost, right? I mean, right. whether it's biofuels or it's solar, um, it's all about cost. And, and it looks like the, I would say that the breakthroughs probably will be there. They're almost exclusively going to be done in the U.S. And, and that is the and, technological and breakthroughs yeah. will be made in the United States. Yeah. And then the question becomes, what are the rules for the technology transfer? How to get them out. Other countries? Yeah. Uh, and, and so for Bahrain, it would be that we need to have windshield wipers on the technology. But uh, assuming that we can make that breakthrough as well, I cut the deal with the guy that, in, uh, who, uh, with the family that still holds the patent rights to that. And I'd uh, love to be able to put a giant biofuels or solar uh, manufacturing facility in Mali or some other poor country. I just don't want to be compelled to do it. So the question is, what are the right incentives? I'm sorry, to and, do that? and how would you be compelled? Uh, if somebody told me I com had to license, you know, that I had to give away my technology to some world body right. versus, versus some incentive structure, which I think could be created to get me to do that. Yeah. Uh, you would lose your incentive to further invest here in the United States if you well, were, were compelled then to transfer the technology overseas. I I exactly. And, I, and I, I would have suspicions that, that our friends in competing um, strategic countries would take advantage of those situations to make lessons. fungible assets like fuels other places. Exactly. Okay, that's great. So uh, here's what I would uh, like to ask each of you to do. We'll start in reverse order of, of uh, the opening statements. Ask each of you, give us the one minute you want us to remember as we're moving forward on uh, these issues uh, in the 130 days up to uh, Copenhagen. Uh, the select committee will be in Copenhagen. 
Uh, and we will be working on the uh, effort to have a bill put on the President's desk before he goes to Copenhagen. So please give us your one minute. Uh, closing bit of advice, Dr. Esper, we will begin with you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my one-minute one minute synopsis is this. Uh, technology is crucial to addressing climate change. And if we want the advanced technologies that are going to get us there, what we need to do is preserve an IP system that has uh, generated technologies over the decades. And so as we look at uh, what's happening now at the UNFCCC and more broadly, it's critical that the United States uh, make clear that the IP rights uh, are not on the table for negotiation or for undermining. And I think the Congress can play an important role in that through, through passing legislation, as you've already done, through uh, speaking to the administration, uh, asking them to come forward, uh, offering statements of your own, but making clear to uh, our partners, both in the developed world and the developing world, who look to us for leadership, that IP rights are the solution, not the problem, and we should focus on the real problems that uh, myself and various others here have outlined today. Ms. Haverkamp. Thank you. Um, I agree tech transfer is technology is critical to solving the climate change problem. Tech transfer is critical to that. What will make that happen are policies. Um, U.S. government policies, the cap on carbon that the waxman -Barkey, markey bill represents, similarly in developing countries, however much technology we develop and are able to send, it won't go to developing countries unless they have domestic policies and incentives that require it to be used there. Uh, as far as the UN climate negotiations, I think they have been very much at a rhetorical stage. Everyone was waiting for the United States to come to the table. Now that the US is here, we need to move the negotiations into a much more thoughtful, um, get down into the details stage of discussion. And I think for the IPR issues, it's time to get more concrete, get beyond the rhetoric to what are the specific concerns that are motivating, what are the examples that are motivating uh, countries' proposals so we can figure out um, what's, what's a serious concern that needs addressing and what's um, negotiating bait. Thank you all very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Nelson. Um, the innovations are happening. They're going to happen in the U.S. They're going to be breakthroughs, and they are going to be the solution to climate change. And they are also going to be what is going to allow us to lead the next 10 or 20 years of the economy in the world. They're going to create a lot of jobs at home, and we need to protect them in a smart way, but also deploy them with incentives, not compulsory. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, Mr. Rao. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, two points I'd like to make. Uh, one is um, what got us here necessarily won't get us there. We have to look at IP very, very differently. So we have successes over the past decade. I think this is going to be very different. Um, I would like to propose that we do actually look at a, an IP exchange uh, combined with some kind of a funding agency, whether we call it a World Bank or Green Bank or whatever it is, where actually this, I think, should be a private, uh, not-for-profit non, non sort of an organization where it's, it's voluntary participation, uh, whether somebody has to, to take, somebody has to contribute. I would like to propose that we take that to the next level and propose that if not, things will continue to happen in China and, and Saudi Arabia and India without the U.S. presence in there, and that probably will be detrimental to us. Thank you. Well, we, we thank uh, each of you. We clearly be, uh, uh, have a challenge before us. Um, we want to protect our intellectual property rights. Uh, we want to make sure that inventors in the United States have an incentive to uh, continue to invent and that investors have an incentive to invest in those inventors. Um, and we have to make sure that we uh, properly analyze the markets that we're talking about. Uh, Ms. Haverkamp, I think, keeps pointing out that we need to commit, create a domestic marketplace for the products that we're inventing here in the United States. What's the point of becoming the world leader in solar and wind if we don't actually uh, not only invent them, but then deploy them here uh, and create the markets here, create the manufacturing jobs here, which is what the Waxman Markey Bill is all about, to create those incentives for the development of a domestic marketplace, even as we then create the rules for the transfer of the technologies into the international marketplace uh, to make sure that the inventors here uh, benefit, but also that uh, the world uh, is presented with a solution to the climate change problem that will affect unfortunately, poorer countries uh, more gravely than, uh, than the wealthier countries. And that's the balance we have to uh, strike here. Uh, 
I think we uh, have to respond uh, to this and embrace the opportunity, uh, the challenge, and to do so in a telescoped uh, time frame. Uh, we have to engage China uh, to make sure that uh, China, as a special case, understands that we need to have uh, some regime of protection of intellectual property put into, uh, into uh, effect uh, uh, so that, uh, uh, that we create the conditions for uh, innovation here uh, while we have a mechanism, perhaps an international green bank, that we can work through as a concept to uh, be able to ensure that this uh, technology is transferred, with, but with proper compensation. Uh, for those who have taken the risk uh, and have the ability to create. So that's really the framework for our challenge going forward for the rest of this year. Uh, with the world gathering, 190 nations coming to Copenhagen, uh, I think they will be looking to the, to the United States to uh, frame this uh, correctly. But they'll also be looking to China uh, to see if we get the proper response uh, from them uh, so that we can be the world leaders uh, in that negotiation. Uh, your hearing has been very helpful uh, to us uh, in the framing of the issue. We would like to stay close to you over the next 130 days so that you can help to illuminate the choices that our policymakers will have to make as we uh, enter those uh, negotiations. Uh, thank you all very much. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So let's go get a picture down here. Can we go do that?